Hi, it's Katrina. Chelyabinsk meteor. Every now and then, space rock fragments called meteorites fall to Earth, sometimes causing widespread damage and injuries. On February 5, 2013, a small asteroid known as the Chelyabinsk meteor, and in saying small, I mean roughly the size of a six-story building, fragmented high up in the atmosphere over Russia, resulting in a blast stronger than a nuclear explosion. The object was exceptionally bright, qualifying it as a bolide or fireball, and may have briefly outshone the sun. Monitoring stations as far away as Antarctica detected the event, which injured around 1,200 people, damaged buildings, and shattered glass. The Chelyabinsk meteor measured roughly 56 feet and weighed around 11,000 tons, according to a statement from scientist and researcher Peter Brown of Western University in Ontario, Canada. It broke up between 12 and 15 miles above Earth and struck the atmosphere at 40,000 miles per hour. Meteorites of this size typically only strike the planet twice every century at the most. Besides being explosive, the Chelyabinsk meteor was incredibly ancient. A scientific analysis of a piece of the rock showed that parts of it formed during the solar system's first four million years of existence. The event raised widespread fears of the potential dangers that space projectiles can pose to us on Earth. In response to these concerns, NASA formed the Planetary Defense Coordination Office, which tracks potentially hazardous objects, provides information about them, and coordinates the U.S. government's response to such threats. If a large asteroid or meteor were to hit Earth, if it's big enough, then dust and smoke would prevent sunlight from reaching us and most likely the temperature would drop. According to Space.com, if an asteroid the size of an apartment hits Earth, this blow could possibly destroy a small city. If an asteroid the size of a 20-story building hits Earth, this blow can completely flatten a small country. So it's good that people are looking out to be able to warn places accordingly. Thankfully, the agency has not detected any imminent threat so far. The way 2020 has been going, though, I wouldn't even be surprised anymore. Do you think this is something we should be worried about, you think? Let me know in the comments below. Meteorite Victim There is only one proven account of an object from space directly hitting a person on its way down to Earth. It happened in 1954 on what appeared to be a typical afternoon in Alabama. While napping on her sofa, a woman named Anne Elizabeth Hodges was pummeled by a softball-sized meteorite. The nine-pound rock blasted through Hodges' ceiling, ricocheted off a radio, and smacked straight into her thigh. Ouch! But don't worry, she recovered. But that's definitely not something you expect while napping. Earlier that day, residents throughout eastern Alabama reported witnessing a bright reddish light like a Roman candle trailing smoke and a fireball like a giant welding arc, the Alabama Museum of History reported in 2010. Locals flocked to Hodge's house, with some rejecting the idea that a meteorite had hit the woman's home, despite the obvious visual evidence and a government geologist's identification of the object as coming from space. Instead, some blamed a plane crash or the Soviets, which makes sense considering the event happened near the height of Cold War paranoia in the U.S. The freak incident was extraordinarily rare, mainly because most asteroids land in the ocean or in the middle of nowhere. You have a better chance of getting hit by a tornado and a bolt of lightning and a hurricane all at the same time, astronomer Michael Reynolds explained in a 2013 National Geographic interview. Hodges obtained ownership of the meteorite after a legal tug-of-war with her landlady over who it rightfully belonged to, and eventually donated it to the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History. Tunguska Event the largest asteroid impact in recorded history, known as the Tunguska event, occurred on the morning of June 30, 1908, in a remote region of Siberia. While barreling towards the Earth at 33,500 miles per hour, a 110,000-ton space rock measuring 120 feet across heated up to 44,500 degrees Fahrenheit. It broke up about 28,000 feet above the ground, releasing the explosive equivalent of 185 Hiroshima bombs, according to NASA. Most of the asteroid consumed itself in the initial explosion, leaving no impact crater while causing something called an airburst, resulting in plenty of damage at ground level. The first attempted expedition to the impact site in 1921, led by Leonid Kulik, then chief curator for the St. Petersburg Museum's meteorite collection, failed due to Siberia's harsh weather. 
Kulik and his team made a second successful attempt to reach the site in 1927. They discovered that the meteor had flattened 800 square miles of forest, with 80 million trees laying on their sides in an outward radial pattern from the epicenter. Locals were initially reluctant to discuss the event with Kulik's team, but they eventually described observing a bluish, extremely bright fireball traveling across the sky, following a flash and a loud explosion. Besides toppling trees, the shockwave reportedly knocked residents off their feet, shattered their windows, and killed reindeer. It is estimated that an asteroid as large as the one involved in the Tunguska event falls to Earth only once every 300 to 1,000 years. Morokfeng Crater Measuring at least 43 miles across, the Morokfeng Crater in South Africa, in the Kalahari Desert, was formed around 145 million years ago, back when Africa, South America, and Antarctica were still connected. Situated near the Botswana border, it was formed by an asteroid measuring between 3.1 and 6.2 miles wide. It is not visible to the naked eye, rather the Morokfang crater was discovered via magnetic and gravimetric surveys in 1994. In 2006, scientists announced the discovery of a sample of the asteroid's fossilized remains, which were recovered from a half mile below ground within a drilling borehole. The discovery of asteroid fragments was unusual, since most space rocks as large as this one are vaporized as they enter the Earth's atmosphere and upon impact. Scientists theorized that the asteroid's impact velocity was lower than normal, enabling parts of it to survive the crash. Also, unlike most asteroids that hit the Earth, this one did not contain iron-nickel metal, suggesting that the fragments came from a different part of the asteroid than experts are familiar with. Consequently, the asteroid's effects on the world around it were also different from other known impacts. Undoubtedly, life in the immediate vicinity, hundreds of kilometers from the center of Morogvang, had a pretty dreadful time, but there is currently no evidence that the Morogvang impact created any kind of mass extinction, explained Dr. Ian McDonald, who participated in the crater's discovery. In other words, while a mass extinction resulting from the asteroid impact cannot be ruled out, all signs point to that it didn't happen, which is pretty much the most likely scenario if an asteroid of this size were to hit again. The area close to the impact would be quite severely affected, but it's hard to say how it would affect the rest of the world. Just cross your fingers you're not next to it when it happens. Sudbury Basin Canada's Sudbury Basin is the world's second largest impact crater. Scientists long wondered how the giant hole formed, and recent groundbreaking research points toward a comet rather than an asteroid as the most likely culprit. Measuring roughly 37 by 18 miles, the Sudbury Basin is located in Ontario, where during the 1880s, miners found abnormal concentrations of copper, nickel, palladium, and other metals. It was clear that an impact of some sort had formed the crater, and during the 1960s and 70s, scientists dated rocks from the Sudbury Basin back between 1.6 and 1.9 billion years. A 2014 study led by then-doctoral candidate Joseph Petrus reanalyzed the chemistry of the rocks and determined, based on their content, that a massive comet crashed into the planet nearly 1.9 billion years ago, carving out an oddly shaped crater measuring 93 miles across. At the time, the only life on Earth consisted of single-celled organisms. Additionally, experts are still trying to fully understand the composition of comets. These factors make it difficult to determine how a comet impact would affect the modern world. It would, no doubt, be disastrous, with some scientists even theorizing that the impact of a 16-mile-wide comet would be up to 300 times more than that of the 106-plus-mile asteroid that wiped out the dinosaurs. Yikes. Chicxulub Crater 66 million years ago, something major happened, causing all the terrestrial dinosaurs on Earth to go extinct. While a series of unfortunate events, such as climate change triggered by volcanic eruptions, may have contributed to wiping the dinosaurs out, many scientists agree that one final event dealt an ultimate fatal blow to the creatures. The Alvarez hypothesis proposes that a huge meteor, possibly the largest ever to hit the Earth, was the perpetuating factor of the dinosaur's extinction. The asteroid, which had an estimated diameter of 106 to 186 miles, smashed into what is now Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula 66,038,000 years ago, precisely when scientists believe the dinosaurs ceased to exist. 
It carved out the 93-mile-wide Chicxulub crater and filled the atmosphere with deadly gas, dust, and debris. Known as the Cretaceous Paleogene KPG extinction event or the Cretaceous Tertiary Extinction KT, the impact eradicated roughly 75% of the world's plant and animal species. The event left evidence in the form of the KPG boundary, a distinctive layer of sediment containing high levels of iridium, a layer of metal that is seldom present on Earth but abundant in asteroids. Due to an incomplete fossil record, it's unclear whether the extinction event occurred rapidly and over a short time, or if it was more drawn out. One thing that remains clear, however, is that the asteroid impact snuffed out nearly all of Earth's life forms, leaving us with an idea of what would possibly happen if a space rock of a similar size slammed into the planet today. Nothing good. 1997 XF-11 in 1998, asteroid astronomers worldwide received data indicating that a one-and-a-half-mile-wide asteroid called 1997 XF-11 would come within 30,000 miles of Earth in 2028, a close enough range to potentially cause it to crash to the ground. Thankfully, the initial observations labeling the asteroid as a danger were disproven by subsequent research, meaning that for those who trust what scientists say, 1997 XF-11 is nothing to worry about. But not everyone is convinced. The space rock, which travels at 31,000 miles per hour, last passed by the globe in 2016, from 16 million miles away, and is due to pass by again in 2028, from a distance of 588,000 miles. At this far away, scientists claim, the asteroid has a zero probability of impacting the planet, in the words of NASA. But what if the experts are wrong? After all, NASA admittedly only knows where less than 10% of potentially threatening near-Earth asteroids are. If 1997 XF-11 or a similarly sized asteroid, such as 2003 YT-1, hit the planet, it would have an impact up to 50 million times that of the atomic bomb that devastated Hiroshima, killing millions of people within one second and causing numerous devastating global effects. The explosion would cause dust clouds to form, blocking sunlight and causing a likely fatal cold and dark period. Good thing it's keeping a safe distance from us, for now. Didymus 65803 Didymus, or Didymus for short, is a binary asteroid that also classifies as a potentially hazardous asteroid and near-Earth object. Discovered in 1996, its 2,600-foot diameter body is orbited by a moon, nicknamed Diddy Moon, which measures 525 feet in diameter. Following the 2013 impact of the Chelyabinsk meteor, various space agencies began entertaining the possibility of deflecting an asteroid that's headed toward Earth. Since Didymus is the closest asteroid of its size to our planet and is slated to come alarmingly close to Earth in coming years, scientists have chosen it as the literal crash test dummy for their asteroid impact avoidance programs. NASA, the European Space Agency, and various other agencies are collaborating in the upcoming Asteroid Impact and Deflection Assessment, or AIDA, mission, which seeks to crash two spacecrafts into Diddy Moon to study the method's effectiveness for altering an asteroid's orbit. The mission starts in October 2021, with the planned launch of NASA's DART, or Double Asteroid Redirection Test, which will launch an impactor into Diddy Moon in 2022. If all goes as planned with DART, the ESA mission HERA will visit the asteroid a few years later to collect data. Thanks to this project, we may never again have to wonder what if when it comes to the prospect of Didymus slamming into the globe. But what if remains a valid question for now. Queen guitarist Brian May, who serves as the face of the ESA's part of the mission, sums it up into the following terrifying statement. Imagine a mountain in the sky with another rock the size of the Great Pyramid swinging around it. That's Didymus. And just the seemingly tiny moon would be big enough to destroy a city if it were to collide with the Earth. Ceres The largest asteroid in our solar system is a dwarf planet named Ceres, which orbits between Mars and Jupiter. Measuring 580 miles in diameter, it's many times larger than the meteor that scientists believe caused the extinction of the dinosaurs, and more broadly, three-quarters of life on Earth. In late 2019, scientists released an alarming animated video demonstrating what would probably happen if Ceres smashed into the planet. 
First, there would be sudden darkness as the object neared Earth and blocked out sunlight. It would begin burning up as it entered the atmosphere. Upon impact, an explosion of unimaginable magnitude would occur, causing tsunamis worldwide, sending debris into space, and even leveling mountain ranges. Simply put, a mass extinction event would ensue. Life as we know it would be over before most of us even had time to think about it or realize what was going on. If anyone survived serious impact, which would be highly unlikely, they would probably succumb to the effects of the nuclear winter that followed. Mysterious Stone Carvings Last year, archaeologists working on the Orkney Archipelago's mainland off the Scottish coast discovered nine strange stone carvings estimated to be around 4,000 years old. The mysterious 1.6-foot-tall objects, which are thought to date back to about 2000 BC, resemble humanoid figures. Carved from stone, they almost look like figures with large bodies, a neck, and a small head. They were found inside a hearth within a box-shaped burial structure in the modern-day settlement of Finstown, while archaeologists checked out the site of a planned electrical substation. This ancient structure consists of two hearths and a ring of holes filled with broken stones. A statement from the Orkney Research Center for Archaeology, or ORCA, explained that the placement of the artifacts within the hearth demonstrates their importance, although their actual purpose is unknown. They were important enough to incorporate into the hearths and into the structure itself, and people weren't known for decorating much back then. One possibility, according to this statement, is that they were used to anchor ropes that held the building's roof in place. Another unanswered question is whether these sculptures were crafted to look like humans or if they were meant to represent something else. While some are very human-like in shape, others are more plain. In the words of Colin Richards from the University of the Highlands and Islands Archaeology Institute, it is very rare to find representations of people in prehistoric Orkney, and when found, they are usually individual or in very small groups. If they are figurines, to find nine figures within one structure is very exciting. Royal Armageddon Tomb For nearly 5,000 years, the ancient city of Megiddo held an important place along international trade and military routes. Located in what is now northern Israel, it was the site of numerous extremely important historical battles that occurred between 3000 BC and 1918, earning the city the nickname of Armageddon, which is derived from Har Megiddo, or Hill of Megiddo. In March 2018, researchers announced the discovery of a 3,600-year-old royal tomb at the site, offering never-before-seen evidence of what life there was like for those who ruled before the Egyptian Empire conquered Megiddo during the 15th century BC. The burial dates back to sometime between 1700 and 1600 BC, during the Middle Bronze Age, and before the dynasty collapsed to the forces of the Egyptian pharaoh Thutmose. Archaeologists who have been working at the site since 1994 and who have unearthed numerous impressive artifacts and structures are nevertheless stunned by the burial chamber. Funny thing is, they weren't looking for it. The team was tipped off to its presence in 2016 when they noticed cracks in the ground, indicating that dirt was falling into an empty cavity. The scientists subsequently discovered an underground tunnel leading to the royal tomb. It contained the remains of a child who passed away between 8 and 10 years of age, a woman in her mid-30s, and a man between the ages of 40 and 46. The family was decked in skillfully crafted gold and silver jewelry, an obvious symbol of their status, with the adult male wearing a gold necklace and crown. The burial chamber was discovered next to Megiddo's Middle Bronze Age royal palace, another indicator of the family's societal ranking. Additionally, the tomb contained various imported items, including ceramic containers from Cyprus and stone jars possibly from Egypt, according to National Geographic. But scientists don't know who these individuals are. They hope to learn more about their identities and origins through DNA tests. 2,200-year-old mosaics The city of Zeugma, located in Gaziantep, Turkey, was once one of the most important centers of the Eastern Roman Empire. Now, it is an enormous treasure trove of archaeological discoveries, with 2,000 to 3,000 houses. Formerly, the city was known as Seleucia, an ancient city and likely a military settlement founded by one of Alexander the Great's commanders. Seleucia was connected to another city, Apamia, by a pontoon bridge. While nothing remains of Apamia, numerous mosaics and other artifacts from Zeugma, which the Romans conquered in 64 AD, survive. 
The ancient city was pretty obscure until 2000, when the construction of a dam began to flood the city, and soon everyone warned that the place would be lost forever unless something was done. It got a lot of media attention, and luckily, archaeologists were able to get the funding to excavate and rescue whatever they could. One of the most important things were the mosaics. Some of them are extremely large, and they were very well preserved. Dating back 2,200 years ago, most of the city is now under 200 feet of water, but there are still parts that are salvageable. The question is how they were able to survive. Zeugma was a very important city until the fall of the Roman Empire, and then it was sacked by Sassanids from Persia. The villas were destroyed and used to keep animals, and everything fell into decay. It then was forgotten about for about 1,700 years. Mosaics were an important part of a home, and the grandeur and quality of some of these shows the extreme wealth and power that once was. Now, when archaeologists excavate another home, there is always the hope of finding another fantastic mosaic. The Stone Age Ghost Clan The Denisovans, an extinct species or subspecies of early humans, were only discovered around a decade ago, based on a genetic analysis of bone fragments and teeth found in the Denisova cave in Siberia. These prehistoric relatives of ours existed tens of thousands of years ago. They occasionally interbred with both Homo sapiens and Neanderthals. But scientists know relatively little about the Denisovans, but are continuously making new breakthroughs and discoveries. Two of the biggest things experts aspire to learn about this ancient hominid species are what they looked like and what they acted like. We can now see that hybridization contributed to our own origins, paleoanthropologist John Hawke said in 2019. That year, new DNA evidence indicated that there were three separate lineages of Denisovans and that they mixed with different human groups throughout Asia. But these findings on their own did not necessarily lead scientists to a picture of what the Denisovans looked like or how they lived. Skull fragments found at Denisova Cave have an unusual thickness that is more like our Homo erectus ancestors than modern humans. On the other hand, a piece of finger bone indicates that the Denisovans had hands and fingers much like ours. So far, all signs point toward them possessing a unique mix of traits, some that were uniquely theirs and others that they perhaps received from those they mixed with, including us. But experts will be disentangling the mysteries of the Denisovans for quite some time to come. An Empire's Collapse In recent years, a Swiss-Russian team of archaeologists discovered a cemetery containing the remains of who they believe are victims of warfare that brought an ancient nomadic empire to an end. The team spent four years excavating a kurgan or a burial mound at the site in Russia's Tuva Republic in southern Siberia, and the findings are helping them better understand a little-known time period and people. The Kurgan, named Tanug I, was built by the Scythians, a nomadic warrior tribe that once had an extensive influence throughout parts of eastern Eurasia, going as far back as 1100 BC. Some of the burials within the mound date back more recently, to sometime between 100 and 400 AD, and when researchers took a closer look at the skeletons, they were shocked. I've never worked with a skeletal population characterized by so much violence, archaeologist Marco Malaya told National Geographic. He continued saying, It wasn't completely surprising at first, but then we found another one, and another one. A lot of these people were exposed to violent interactions, and the evidence was not just on adult males, but also in kids. In a research paper on their grisly findings that was published in the Journal of Physical Anthropology, Malaya and his colleagues describe 100 of the gruesome skeletal injuries, painting a horrifying picture of intense violence among the nomadic steppe societies of the time. They examined the remains of at least 87 individuals, at least 20 of whom displayed signs of bone trauma such as cut marks, holes made by arrowheads and sword tips, and being bludgeoned. The majority of the victims were preteens and adults, but include people of all ages, including an elderly woman. Archaeologist Gino Caspari explained in a National Geographic interview that the burials likely reflect the rampant and widespread instability and violence that came following the collapse of the region's Xiongnu Empire around 100 AD. The Kurgan dates back to a several century long span that is little understood, but is believed to be marked by extreme political upheaval. The remains there are not from one massacre, but several that occurred over time. In the words of archaeologist Christopher Newsell, this suggests tit-for-tat reprisal violence. In other words, the brutal fighting went on, back and forth, for hundreds of years.
Who were the Guanches? Spain's Canary Islands were once inhabited by a mysterious civilization of unknown origins called the Guanches, who arrived long before the first Spanish settlers set foot there during the 1470s. Archaeologists and others have long debated over where the Guanches came from, with some speculating that they descended from the Celts or Vikings, and others suggesting that the civilization was somehow connected to the lost city of Atlantis. Thanks to DNA technology, however, experts are closer than ever to figuring out who the Guanches were. The BBC reported last year that a genetic analysis of some of the society's ancient mummies revealed that they were likely Berbers from North Africa. They probably arrived at the islands around 100 AD, or perhaps earlier, were likely ruled by a chief, and engaged in a lifestyle that consisted of both farming and hunting and gathering. But knowing this about the Guanches does not solve all the mysteries surrounding them. For example, researchers still don't know how the civilization reached the Canary Islands, although some think that small boats would have been enough to get the job done. They are also unsure how many Guanche settlers there were, but the study notes that as few as 14 couples could have successfully populated the territory. Underground Chambers In May of this year, archaeologists working in Israel announced the rather unexpected discovery of an ancient subterranean complex of chambers carved into the bedrock of the Western Wall Plaza. It's located roughly 120 feet from the Temple Mount and Haram al-Sharif, or the Noble Sanctuary, a site holy to both Jews and Muslims. For the past 1400 years, the underground set of rooms sat hidden beneath the white mosaic floor of a Byzantine-era building. The complex consists of two rooms and a courtyard, which are situated at different depths and connected via carved staircases, and the walls contain niches that likely once served as shelving and storage space. The chambers date back to roughly 2,000 years ago, based on artifacts contained inside. Included among the finds are clay vessels and a large stone basin that is believed to have been used for holding water as part of certain Jewish purity rituals. When the complex was built, it was part of the city's civic center, according to archaeologist Barak Manikendam Given. We think that the public street passed just a few meters from here, he explained. The site itself, which occupies roughly 35 acres, is an archaeological hotspot with numerous civilizations including the Babylonians, Greeks, Persians, Romans, Byzantines, and more. But the complex is one of ancient Jerusalem's few surviving remains. Beyond being rare, however, it's shrouded in mystery. Researchers are unsure what the underground room's purpose or purposes was, or why their creator bothered taking the immense time and effort required to carve them out of solid stone. Generally speaking, the only other rock-cut structures in the area dating back to the same era are burials. Archaeologists are equally dumbfounded about the use for the Byzantine-era building that sits above the complex, and they are hoping that further research helps them find the answers they're looking for. Unidentified Royal Palace A discovery hailed as one of the most important of its region also qualifies as one of the area's most mysterious finds. When Iraq experienced a severe drought in mid-2019, the receding waters of the Mosul Dam Reservoir alerted a German and Kurdish team of archaeologists to the presence of a 3,400-year-old palace. The surprising structure was built by the Mitanni Empire, which is largely considered one of the least understood ancient civilizations. In response to the discovery, the team began an emergency excavation to save the ruins before the reservoir's waters returned to normal levels. This was especially important, considering the palace is among just a handful of ruins that have ever been uncovered from the Mitanni Empire. Even the capital of the Mitanni Empire has not been identified, archaeologist Ivana Poljitz told DW.com. The team worked against the clock and against rising waters, taking record of and salvaging what they could. Researchers planned to try interpreting 10 cuneiform tablets that were found at the site. Also included among the discoveries were bright blue and red wall paints, which experts believe were customarily used in palaces throughout the ancient Near East. Elixir of Immortality In early 2019, archaeologists discovered a strange yellowish liquid while examining a several thousand-year-old ancient Chinese pot. The pot and the contents in question, which dates back to the Western Han Dynasty, was discovered in China's Henan province in late 2018. It was found within a spacious 2,260-square-foot burial chamber in the city of Luoyang. Scientists concluded that the mixture is a long-fabled immortality elixir of Chinese legend. The liquid smelled like wine, leading the team to initially think they had discovered liquor, perhaps rice wine. 
but subsequent testing proved otherwise as the substance proved to be made up of potassium nitrate and alunite. These ingredients are customary for a longevity elixir, according to experts, which typically consisted of substances that we know today are incredibly dangerous to consume. But this was the first time archaeologists found an actual example of one. Ironically, in the past, people believed that consuming these potentially fatal potions gave them eternal life. Although it's unknown whether anyone consumed the liquid found in the pot in Henan province, it offers valuable insight into our understanding of the region's past. The liquid is of significant value for the study of ancient Chinese thoughts on achieving immortality and the evolution of Chinese civilization, Shi Jiazhen, head of the Institute of Cultural Relics and Archaeology, told Xinhua News. Numerous other artifacts were found at the site, including painted clay pots, a goose-shaped lamp, and the remains of the individual who was laid to rest inside the tomb. Europe's Earliest Toolmakers Britain's oldest human remains were found at Eartham Pit, an archaeological site in West Sussex, England. Situated northeast of Boxgrove, it was first excavated between 1982 and 1986. There, scientists found bones belonging to Homo heidelbergensis, an extinct species or subspecies of early humans, dating back 500,000 years ago. Based on the first human bone discovered at the site, a partial tibia, researchers estimate that the person the bone belonged to was around 6 feet tall and weighed roughly 176 pounds. Bigger than you might have expected, right? The tibia's robust size suggests that the person ran a lot, perhaps in pursuit of animals, or that the individual was accustomed to cold weather. Archaeologists also found two incisors belonging to an ancient hominid, which bore signs of severe gum disease. More recently, in August of this year, excavations turned up the earliest known evidence of humans hunting and butchering in Europe, in the form of horse bone tools that were found at the site. The discovery indicates that the prehistoric people who lived there were culturally, socially, and cognitively advanced. Project lead Dr. Matthew Pope from UCL's Institute of Archaeology said, this was an exceptionally rare opportunity to examine a site pretty much as it had been left behind by an extinct population after they had gathered to totally process the carcass of a dead horse on the edge of a coastal marshland. Incredibly, we've been able to get as close as we can to witnessing the minute-by-minute -minute movement and behaviors of a single, apparently tight-knit group of early humans, a community of people, young and old, working together in a cooperative and highly social way. The horse provided more than food back then, as it was then turned into tools, too. Many people would come together and participate in the butchering, almost like a community event, and nothing was wasted. These bone tools are some of the earliest non-stone tools ever found on the planet. Battle of Visby The Battle of Visby occurred on July 22, 1361, near the town of Visby on Gotland, Sweden's largest island, which is located 56 miles east of the mainland in the Baltic Sea. Visby was a wealthy trading city and a member of a confederation of merchant towns that had a pact to help defend against invaders. These towns were not only full of expensive goods, but were also extremely powerful. King Valdemar Atterdag of Denmark decided that they were rivals and was determined to get his hands on Visby's wealth, so he sent his army of Danish and German soldiers to attack. As they advanced toward the shore, Gotland's residents attempted unsuccessfully to halt their efforts. Around half of Visby's farmers, 1,800 people died in the action, forcing the town to surrender. The dead from both sides were hastily buried in a mass grave, along with their armor, weapons, and personal belongings, including spears, hoods, and this armored glove. When archaeologists excavated the site during the 1920s, they uncovered plenty of human bones with severe battle injuries, including smashed skulls and skulls with spears and knives jammed into them. Some of the skeletons were still wearing their chainmail and armor. Also included among the artifacts are weapons, headgear, gauntlets, swords, crossbows, and arrowheads. Other miscellaneous items were found, including a leather pouch full of valuable coins, which probably belonged to one of Valdemar's soldiers. After the battle, Visby's residents paid King Valdemar a hefty sum to avoid further problems. Didn't go quite as smoothly after that, but the incredibly well-preserved remains of armor and weapons are a treasure trove of information and are now on display at the Gotland Museum as a testament to the people who tried to defend it. Tanagra Figurines While plowing soil in the town of Bratsy in the Greek region of Boeotia during the 1860s, some peasants hid upon numerous ancient graves. 
While they didn't contain huge hordes of gold and gemstones, they did have beautiful, lifelike terracotta figurines. Hundreds of these small statues were found, mostly of females measuring about 3 to 9 inches tall. The discovery set off a craze for the figurines, and around 8,000 of the region's graves were subsequently looted. People paid exorbitant sums for the artifacts, and for both sloppy and skilled forgeries, some of which even ended up in museums. In fact, National Geographic recently revealed that up to 20% of the German state's collection of the figurines are fake. As it turns out, the Tanagra figurines were just as popular during their time of manufacture, around the 4th century BC, as they became once they were rediscovered. They were present throughout the Mediterranean, including Greece, Macedonia, parts of Asia, southern Italy, North Africa, and even the Middle East. The statues were so attractive because they fit in with the ideals of feminine beauty and fashion of 19th century Europe, just as they did 1600 years ago. The Greeks were very talented with sculpting clay, and the figures ranged from the elderly sitting to the young dancing away. It is a glimpse into daily life of everyday women and children, which is not really mentioned in historical records from the time. It is not quite clear what they were for, although one prevailing theory holds that they were used in burial practices, based on where they were found. The sculpture's magic is paradoxically captured in their ordinary activities, and their depictions of everyday scenes, people, and gestures. With their delicate figures and draped clothing, they convey attributes like modesty, mildness, and femininity. The original reason for burying these figurines has been forgotten, but the custom remains. Dinosaur's Last Meal In June of this year, scientists announced the discovery of the fossilized remains of a dinosaur's last meal. The football-sized mass consisted of 88% chewed leaf material and 7% stems and twigs, according to study co-author and biologist David Greenwood. Researchers further noticed that the dinosaur was a picky eater who preferred certain types of leaves over others. The 110-million-year-old dinosaur, a massive armored species called Borealopelta mark Michelli, ate fern leaves, twigs, and stems before it died. The 2,900-pound creature may have feasted amid wildfires, as evidenced by charcoal fragments present on some of the food. After it ate, it passed away and was washed out to sea in what is now northern Alberta, Canada. This dinosaur was discovered accidentally in 2011, and it is one of the best fossils of its kind ever found. The creature was entombed shortly after death, given the remarkably preserved state of its remains. Geologist Jim Bassinger of the University of Saskatchewan said in a statement that the discovery is rare and constitutes the best preserved dinosaur stomach ever found too. Mysterious Massacre Earlier this year, Brio Retirement Living Holdings, a UK-based property development firm, came under fire for failing to report 42 bizarrely buried skeletons that were discovered on a property in Buckinghamshire, England, where the company planned to build retirement condos. Luckily, they weren't recent skeletons. The remains were found in shallow graves on former farmland, and some of the individual's hands were tied behind their backs. An archaeological team commissioned by the development firm discovered the skeletons, yet the company did not notify authorities of the find as they were legally required to do. The bodies were quietly removed from the site, and once local authorities found out, they were incredibly displeased, to say the least. We haven't seen anything of this nature in Buckingham before, Buckingham South Councillor Robin Stutchbury told the Daily Mail. The remains are thought to belong to Danes, of Daneland, who were executed during an 11th century failed invasion against the Anglo-Saxons. They were likely prisoners of war, due to some of them having their hands bound, according to Stutchbury, who believes the individuals were possibly murdered during the St. Bryce's Day Massacre. The bloody event occurred on November 13, 1002, when King of England Ethelred the Unready ordered the killing of the Danes. Yikes. I wouldn't want to be remembered for all time by that nickname, the unready. What do you think people would call you? The super ready? The patient? The cranky? The lazy? Let me know in the comments below. The skeletons could also belong to hanged criminals, or people who died in the English Civil War during the 17th century. But Buckinghamshire council member Bill Chapel pointed out that the remains are thought to date back at least 1,000 years. Carbon dating analysis reports will determine the age of the bones, giving researchers a starting point for determining who the people might be and why they died. Oldest Royal Remains 
The remains of a mysterious royal were unearthed in 2008 at Madgeburg Cathedral in Germany. Researchers were quick to speculate that the body belonged to Queen Edgith, a Saxon princess who married the Holy Roman Emperor Otto I in 929. She had two children by her husband and was the half-sister of the first king of England in its entirety, Ethelstan, and the great-granddaughter of the Anglo-Saxon king Alfred the Great. The Great is always a good nickname. Edith passed away in 946 at around 36 years old after spending the majority of her married life in Madgeburg in the modern-day state of Saxony-Anhalt. Her remains were relocated at least three times before ending up at Madgeburg Cathedral in 1510. Medieval bones were moved frequently and often mixed up, so it required some exceptional science to prove that they are indeed those of Edgith, project director Professor Harold Meller told the BBC. Evidence shows that the deceased individual was a 30 to 40 year old woman of high status, a frequent horseback rider who ate a high protein diet. An analysis of her teeth matched up with historical records detailing Edgith's Wessex childhood. Experts have accepted the test results as proof of the body's identity as Edgith making her skeleton the oldest known surviving remains of an English royal. The City of 1001 Churches The capital of medieval Armenia, a lost city called Ani, survives only in the form of ruins of several churches and a broken bridge. Situated in the modern-day Turkish province of Kars, the ancient metropolis was once a thriving cultural religious center. During the early 300s, Ani adopted Christianity as its official religion, making it one of the first kingdoms to do so. At its peak, the city housed as many as 100,000 residents and is thought to have served as the 10th century Armenian capital, according to National Geographic. Ani was best known for its numerous religious structures, earning it the nickname of the City of 1001 Churches. It was invaded repeatedly over the centuries due to its strategic position between competing empires and along the Silk Road trade route. In the 16th century, Ani was absorbed into the Ottoman Empire and subsequently abandoned and forgotten about. During the early 19th century, European travelers began frequenting the intriguing site, feeling drawn to its architecture and heavy Christian symbolism, despite political tensions in the region remaining at an all-time high. The first archaeological survey of Ani was carried out long after time and the elements began taking a noticeable toll on its buildings and it wasn't until 2016 that the site was declared a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Water Purification System A recent study determined that a more than 2,000-year-old water purification system, one of the oldest in the world, that was developed by the ancient Maya people would still work today. American archaeologists discovered evidence of the advanced Mesoamerican society's creation in Tikal, an ancient city in northern Guatemala. The large reservoir, called Corriental, contains zeolite and crystalline quartz, which the Maya used to filter their drinking water. This combination of compounds is still used today in modern water filtration systems. In ancient Mesoamerica, it acted as a sieve that removes heavy metals, harmful microbes, and numerous other toxins, according to the experts who conducted the study. The team traced the zeolite and quartz to a source 18 miles northeast of Tikal, with a reputation for its naturally clean drinking water. It was probably through very clever empirical observation that the ancient Maya saw this particular material was associated with clean water and made some effort to carry it back to Tikal, study author and geographer Nicholas Dunning said. The filtration system qualifies as the oldest such device in the New World, and it also predates European versions of water filters. A lot of people look at Native Americans in the Western Hemisphere as not having the same engineering or technological muscle of places like Greece, Rome, India, or China, said study author and anthropologist Kenneth Barnett Tankersley. But when it comes to water management, the Maya were millennia ahead. Flight Evolution A newly released study reveals that pterosaurs, the first flying vertebrates, were initially clumsy flyers who became more skilled as they evolved. The findings published in the journal Nature Communications describes how pterosaurs first began flying 320 million years ago and continuously improved until their extinction 65 million years ago, when an asteroid is thought to have slammed into the Earth and wiped out the dinosaurs. This means that on average for 150 million years, descendants were better flyers than their ancestors, study author Chris Venditti told ZME Science. This is a quite striking and unique demonstration of Darwin's idea of descent with modification, 
as species get better in their environment. Pterosaurs were reptiles and close relatives of dinosaurs who flew using the same mechanisms as birds and bats by generating lift using their wings. Over time, they evolved into a diverse range of species, including the largest winged animals that ever existed and occupied all corners of the globe. The team of experts who conducted the study determined that natural selection got straight to work as soon as pterosaurs emerged into existence and persistently worked to maximize their flight efficiency, enabling them to fly for long periods and over great distances without stopping. The researchers noted one exception to this trend as darkoids, a group of pterosaurs that were not so adept at flight and who they speculate were consequently more geared toward a terrestrial lifestyle, generally only flying when they needed to. Denisovan Teeth Over the summer, a team of experts from the Novosibirsk Institute of Archaeology and Ethnography discovered two teeth in the Denisova cave in southern Siberia. One was estimated to be at least 170,000 years old, and another dating back approximately 250,000 years. The site is well known for its wealth of archaeological evidence left behind by early hominids, namely the Denisovans an extinct species or subspecies of archaic humans. The two recently discovered teeth, a milk tooth and a molar, were found in the oldest layer of artifact containing sediment within the cave. They are both Denisovan teeth. The Denisovans lived throughout Asia during the Lower and Middle Paleolithic, according to Mikhail Shunkov, who headed the expedition. Numerous other artifacts from the ancient hominin species have been found inside the cave. The first among them, discovered in 2008, is a finger bone fragment belonging to a young female whom scientists coined X-Woman. When they realized that she was neither Homo sapiens nor Neanderthal, they coined the term Denisovan to represent her species. Denisova cave was not exclusive to the Denisovans, however. Scientists have also discovered Neanderthal remains and evidence of humans occupying the site. But the Denisovans appear to have been the cave's first inhabitants, with their presence dating back some 300,000 years indicating that they migrated from the Middle East around that time. Amazon Warrior Women For a long time, Greek stories about fierce female warriors called the Amazons were widely regarded as purely mythical. At some point, however, historians and other experts began questioning whether these Amazon warrior women once truly existed. The prevailing theory suggests that the Amazons were actually females from the nomadic Scythian culture, a series of tribes that originated in southern Siberia and expanded as far west as the Black Sea, and they were known for their ferocity. Earlier this year, archaeologists in Russia discovered grave sites dating back to the 4th century BC of four warrior women ranging in age from around 12 years old to somewhere between 45 and 50 years old. They were buried alongside their weapons, and one of the women, who was in her 20s when she died, was laid to rest in a horse-riding position. These four women were companions in warfare and probably died in a skirmish together, historian Adrian Mayer told Here and Now's Tanya Mosley. Mayer further explained that while ancient Greek historians never questioned the Amazon's existence, modern researchers resigned to the belief that the warrior women were imaginary, after failing to trace the origins of legends about them. Greek mythology, art, and literature portrayed Amazon women as equals of men, according to a National Geographic history article by Mayer. They had a reputation for being brave, skilled at warfare, and beautiful but dangerous, and possessed sexual freedom that was only enjoyed by men in many cultures of the time. Discoveries of Scythian graves revealed that women trained and fought alongside men, learning how to shoot arrows on horseback, hunt, and combat enemy tribes. Moreover, while the Amazons did not fulfill traditional gender roles, they were still mothers. Archaeologists have discovered graves of nomadic Scythian women containing children and babies, as well as the women's weapons. Additionally, Greek texts tracing Amazon generations show clear matrilineal patterns, further demonstrating women's importance in ancient Scythian society. Amazon warrior women were real. Ancient Pirate King's Treasure Trove a small uninhabited Greek islet in the Aegean Sea called Vryokastraki contains a treasure trove of artifacts that are helping to paint a picture of the region's past as well as the story of an ancient pirate king. Vryokastraki, which is part of the modern-day Cyclades Islands, contains a small settlement that was inhabited continuously from the 12th century BC to the 7th century AD. After that, its inhabitants abandoned it for a larger nearby island possibly due to pirate warfare. 
Evidence of another Cycladic settlement dating as far back as the 3rd century BC recently turned up on Vrio Kastraki. Archaeologists spent the summer excavating numerous sites throughout the islet. They learned that at one time throughout its history, Vrio Kastraki was ruled by a pirate king, according to inscriptions found at one site. The team also discovered clay female figurines and bronze votive offerings dating back to the classical period, and a heavily eroded altar at the site of a temple, as well as a 295-foot-long Byzantine complex with walls made of large stones. The complex, which contains 15 rooms, including one that was used for storing and preparing food, separated the port from the rest of the island and provided access between the two. Researchers believe the complex was a fortress meant to protect the island's interior at a time when the Aegean Sea was rife with piracy. One inscription speaks of a notorious 4th century BC pirate named Glauchetus, or Glafketus, who ruled the islet and others nearby. While it's unknown what Glauchetus used the islands for, one theory is that they served as a base from which to plunder shipping vessels. The little-known pirate ruler is conspicuously absent from most other historical texts, but according to the record, the Macedonians supported him and the Athenians eventually pushed him out of power. Najaswara Swami Temple Earlier this year, ambitious volunteers in the Indian state of Andhra Pradesh discovered the sand-covered ruins of a 200-year-old Hindu temple along the Pena River. Locals had long known about the temple called Najaswara Swami and collected money to fund its excavation since everyone was bored during quarantine and a group decided to take matters into their own hands. In less than a day, the pinnacle of the long-buried structure was uncovered. Najaswara Swami was covered in sand and sediment from the nearby river starting as early as 1850. Thanks to massive floods, state archaeologist Rama Subha Reddy told the Hindu following the discovery. According to locals, the temple was buried for nearly 80 years. Concerned about damage to the structure, local authorities stopped the dig. Worshippers flocked to the site anyway, and residents hoped to see Najaswara Swami reconstructed to its former glory. At the last update, representatives plan to inspect the site and determine the appropriate next steps. Zoomorphs of Kirigua During the 1880s, Alfred Percival Maudslay, also known as the father of Mesoamerican archaeology, discovered a series of zoomorphic structures at Kirigua, an archaeological site along the Motagua River in Guatemala, near the border with Honduras. The sculptures include the Maya civilization's tallest known carved monumental structures and its most elaborately carved altars. Quirigua is home to what may very well be the Maya civilization's largest plaza, measuring 981 feet long and 654 feet wide. Kaktili Chanyopat, the city's most prolific ruler, established much of the site at the plaza and within close proximity. The site's earliest monuments were erected between 200 and 400 AD, while most of the structures that have been excavated are located near the city center and were built during the late Classic period, starting around 600 AD. One sculpture known as Monument 16, or the Great Turtle Altar, is considered one of the Maya's greatest masterpieces. This and another monument, known as Altar P, were dedicated by the ruler Sky Sul around 795 AD, not long before the Maya civilization collapsed and the city itself was deserted. Quirigua lies slightly outside the known Maya areas of the time and likely had a maximum population of somewhere between 1,600 and 2,000 residents. It was settled by around 200 AD as a strategic place for controlling the trade that went up and down the Motagua River. This and the nearby city of Copan enabled the Maya ruling elite to expand the civilization's trading network, although Quirigua was seemingly little more than a small outpost. Like the rest of the Maya world, Quirigua met an inevitable end during a time period known as the Classic Maya Collapse. The city went into irreversible decline after the last inscriptions were etched around 810 AD and was subsequently abandoned. Ancient Sword Roman Novak, a mushroom picker in the Jesenic area of northeastern Czech Republic's Moravia region, recently discovered a rare 3,300-year-old Bronze Age sword and an axe. He noticed the sword's blade sticking out among some stones, and so he dug further and was able to unearth the items. Novak notified archaeologists who determined that the weapons date back to around 1300 BC, a time when the region was sparsely populated. The sword has an octagonal handle, explained G.D. Jukelka, the nearby Silesian Museum's lead archaeologist. 
It is only the second sword of its type to be found here. The weapon was made by pouring liquid bronze into a mold and resembles similar weapons from northern Germany, according to Jukelka. Soil tests prove that it was made locally and was not ready for combat. They were obviously trying their best, but the quality of the casting was actually pretty low, Jukelka told Czech Radio. X-ray tests show that there are many small bubbles inside the weapon. This suggests that the sword was not used in combat, but was instead of symbolic value. It would have broken very easily. Archaeologists plan to survey the area where the weapons were found, in case there are any more artifacts waiting to be discovered, and to find out more about the few people who lived there at the time. Lola's Chewing Gum In the first ever case of scientists extracting a complete ancient human genome from non-human materials, turns out ancient people also chewed gum. Studies of a wad of chewing gum covered in ancient saliva found at the Silfholm archaeological site on the Danish island of Lowland is offering a clearer glimpse than ever at Europe's early Neolithic hunter-gatherers. The DNA analysis, which is detailed in a recently published study, revealed that a young woman with dark skin and hair and blue eyes chewed the wad of birch tar around 5,700 years ago. Not quite Wrigley's, but you know. The individual, nicknamed Lola, was genetically more similar to hunter-gatherers from mainland Europe than the people of southern Scandinavia at the time. She was likely a hunter-gatherer who migrated to Lowland from elsewhere and lived alongside farmers during a transitional period, when agriculture was first introduced in the region. In addition to her own DNA, Lola left behind genetic information about things she ate and her microbiome, meaning the microbes that lived in her mouth. The findings, which were published in the journal Nature Communications, show that she ate duck and hazelnuts around the time she chewed the gum. Lola was lactose intolerant, had severe gum disease, and suffered from pneumonia at some time in her life, although it's unknown whether Lola had pneumonia when she chewed the tree pitch. In fact, researchers don't know when Lola passed away, only when she chewed the gum, because no actual human remains have been found at the site. By analyzing the DNA of ancient chewing gum, especially from sites with no other signs of a human presence, researchers can better study how ancient populations changed over the centuries, how they lived, and what their health was like. Did you ever imagine how much you could learn from a piece of chewing gum from the Stone Age? Neither did I. Ancient Female Hunters a recently published Science Magazine report confirms that the bones of an ancient hunter discovered at the Willamaya Pacha archaeological site in Peru belong to a female, challenging long-held notions of traditional gender roles in prehistoric societies. Found at nearly 12,900 feet above sea level, alongside a toolkit of 20 neatly stacked stone projectile points and blades, the bones initially seem to belong to a high-status hunter, possibly a chief. But to University of Arizona bioarchaeologist Jim Watson, the remains appeared slender, indicating that they perhaps belonged to a woman. After pointing this out, researchers re-examined old findings of ancient human remains that were discovered throughout the Americas, and detected ten more burials of women accompanied by weapons, who were most likely hunters. The message of the new findings is that women have always been able to hunt and have in fact hunted, archaeologist Bonnie Pitblado told Science Magazine. The woman discovered in Peru was found among the remains of five other humans, including a male hunter and animal bone fragments from Andean deer and vicuña. She most likely died between the age of 17 and 19, and unlike other burials for women, the fact that she had her tools like a knife, flake rocks, and spears buried with her signified that they were extremely important. Researchers determined the female hunter's gender by analyzing her tooth enamel proteins, which exist as distinguishable male and female versions. Her teeth also showed that like other hunters, she ate a meat-heavy diet and also consumed plants. The hunt is now on to find and analyze the remains of other possible female hunters in the Americas. First Ever Furnace Archaeologists recently published a study revealing the discovery of a 6,500-year-old furnace in Beersheba, a city in southern Israel's Negev Desert. The findings, featured in the Journal of Archaeological Science, resulted from three years of research at the site that began with an emergency excavation in 2017. Throughout the digs, the team found a small copper smelting workshop containing furnace fragments made from tin, making it possibly the oldest furnace ever. 
Tossing lumps of ore into a fire will get you nowhere, researcher Erez Ben Yosef explained in a statement about the discovery. You need certain knowledge for building special furnaces that can reach very high temperatures while maintaining low levels of oxygen. A subsequent analysis of the artifacts revealed that the workshop operated based on two-stage technology, which involved first smelting the copper ore, then refining it. The ore used there came from one of the Roman Empire's largest copper mines, which was located 60 miles away in Wadi Fainan in modern-day Jordan. The refining of copper was the high-tech of that period, said Ben Yosef, adding that there was no technology more sophisticated than that in the whole of the ancient world. The workshop was built by the Gasulian culture, a society known for its artistic achievements, and now for its advanced furnace technology. Early Humans in Greece In mid-2019, a study revealed the possible discovery of the earliest human remains ever found outside of Africa. In the 1970s, skull fragments from two individuals were found along the coastline of southern Greece. Known as the Apidema fossils, they suggest that a Neanderthal died there around 170,000 years ago, and an early modern human perished at the site at least 210,000 years ago. These findings, if confirmed true, add to a collection of discoveries in recent years that challenge the previously held theory that our ancestors first migrated out of Africa around 65,000 years ago. But not all experts agree with the study's results, including paleoanthropologist Juan Luis Arzuaga, who told National Geographic, I cannot see anything suggesting that the individual belongs to the sapiens lineage. He has a point, after all, only the Neanderthal skull is complete, and both are distorted from spending thousands upon thousands of years encased in rock. Using CT scanning and virtual reconstruction technology, the team produced an image of what they believe to be the human skull based on a single fragment from the back of the head, which contains distinctly human characteristics. While it's important to proceed with caution when it comes to identifying ancient hominid remains, this and other discoveries are helping experts to retrace the migration patterns of our earliest ancestors. Thanks for watching! Which discovery is your favorite? What would you like to learn more about? Let me know in the comments below and be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. See you next time! Bye!